And on this episode, I want to share with you what I see as some of the many, but some of the most important principles underlying the American Revolution, which are absolutely essential for people to adopt in wide numbers if we really want to advance liberty in a big way in modern times. I'm going to start with a quick overview by what we mean by the American Revolution. The real American Revolution we know was a radical change in the view of the people before the war for independence. But I'll get to that in a little bit more detail. And there was actually a little interesting Virginia versus Massachusetts debate that went on for a short while about when the revolution actually started. And then from there, I've got tons of great insight from people like Patrick Henry, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Samuel Adams, James Otis, John Dickinson, and a few others. Because I do want to get right to the information and to follow along with all the stuff that I'm covering today, tons of original source documents, a few other episodes that you should check out as well. You want to follow us over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. That's where I publish a blog post about one to two hours after the live stream is done. And there you will also find in that blog post a show link section. So if you're thinking, dude, uh, you mentioned that letter that John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson. And where do I find that? Because you only, you know, gave us a couple of lines from that. I want to find it, read it and be able to cite it to other people as well. Uh, so that will be in the show notes section over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. And speaking of the letter from John Adams to Thomas Jefferson, as I mentioned just a minute or so ago, I want to start out with an understanding of what the real American Revolution was. What, when did the, the revolution start? Was it in April of 1775, Lexington and Concord? Absolutely not. That was something that happened after the revolution had already commenced. And here's John Adams in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, August 24th, 1815, when they became fast, well, fast friends to some degree uh, later in life again. And he writes this, what do we mean by the revolution? The war? That was no part of the revolution. It was only an effect and consequence of it. And I think uh, a lot of people, I mean, we think of the American Revolution as the war for independence, but the people at that time didn't think of it the same way. And although this is 1815, I don't, this is, this is important stuff. He said the revolution was in the minds of the people, and this was affected from 1660 or 1760 through 1775, in the course of 15 years before a drop of blood was drawn at Lexington. And the point might also be that they may not have been able to win a war for independence without having a revolution in thought where you could get all of these people from different backgrounds and different colonies all standing together under one banner. He said the records of the 13 legislatures, the pamphlets, newspapers, and all the colonies ought to be consulted during that period to ascertain the steps by which the public opinion was enlightened and informed concerning the authority of parliament over the colonies. So if we want to understand the strategy and the steps that they took over time, we have to go back to the period 1760 through 1775 and if this is one of the most successful revolutions in world history, one of the most important ones, if we want to learn today, if we want to advance liberty against, once again, the largest government in the history of the world, maybe there are some ingredients. Maybe there's a recipe that we can learn from and try to apply today. Now, Adams repeated this. He didn't just say it to Thomas Jefferson. He repeated this over and over and over in various letters here, for example, to Thomas McKean, in November of that year, 1815, he said the revolution was in the minds of the people and in the union of the colonies, both of which were accomplished before hostilities commenced. This revolution and union were gradually forming from the year 1760 through 1775. 
1775. And then he made to Thomas as well the same recommendations that he made to Thomas Jefferson, which is if you want to understand that process, the strategy and how you got from here to there, I think people were really interested in having another history of the revolution. I guess Mercy Otis Warrens wasn't good enough for John Adams because she didn't like how he acted later in life when he got power. But that is just another example of you can't trust anyone with power, including the people who are good about power before they have that power. So he made the same recommendation to Thomas McKean that he did to Thomas Jefferson about, well, if you want to understand the strategy and the process of the American Revolution, what it was all about, you have to study the records of what happened in those times. And here he is in a letter to Dr. Jedediah Morse, uh, maybe a few days later as well. He said, a history of military op operations from April 19th, 1775, that's Lexington and Concord, to the 3rd of September, 1783, that's the Treaty of Paris, is not a history of the American Revolution, any more than the Marquis of Quincy's military history of Louis XIV, though much esteemed, is a history of the reign of that monarch. So it's absurd to say that the American Revolution was just about the fighting because he wouldn't have been able to have a, vic a victory in any way without a revolution in thought. Now, I think Thomas Jefferson in many ways agreed with this. Here he is in a letter to Henry Lee some years later in 1825. He was talking about the Declaration of Independence not being something radical or new that just started at that point in 1776, but instead something much broader. And he said the Declaration of Independence, the object, was not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, not merely to say things which had never been said before, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject. He continued, he said it was intended to be an expression of the American mind, and to give that expression the proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. All its authority rests then on the harmonizing sentiments of the day, whether expressed in conversations and letters, printed essays, or in the elementary books of public rights, such as Aristotle, Cicero, Locke, Algernon, Sidney, etc. So Jefferson also recognized what they were putting down in the, the uh, Declaration of Independence was the harmonizing ten sentiments of the day. And those didn't just start from common sense in January 76 with Thomas Paine. They didn't start just the year before. They didn't start that day. They didn't start in the Second Continental Congress. They weren't from Jefferson. They weren't from Adams or anyone else. It was a broad view of the people. And that type of thing certainly takes time. So anyways, where does it start? John Adams said, you know, 1760 to 1775, here he is in a letter to William Tudor, March of 1817. He's talking about the beginning where the, you know, really the resistance kicks off was in 1761. And that's James Otis Jr.'s speech against the writs of assistance in February of 1761. He said, Otis was a flame of fire. American independence was there and then born. Then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. An arbitrary power is power that is really just exercised on a whim by government. Arbitrary power was also one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence. It's basically what we live under constantly today. A government that doesn't follow the rules is just extra or goes beyond the limits given to it is exercising arbitrary power. And that happens 24-7, 365 here in modern times. So then and there was the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child independence was born in 15 years. 1776, he grew up to manhood and declared himself free. And so what did James Otis Jr. say in this speech? It was hours long. And even though he was mostly railing, I mean, he was there to rail against the writs of assistance, were, which were general search warrants rather than what uh, Otis called special warrants or warrants, what we have in the Fourth Amendment today, you know, has to be specifically naming the place, person, place or thing to be searched or seized, for example. But it was also a radical change in the views of sovereignty. Who held final authority all through history? The founders, the old revolutionaries, the people that, you know, that they uh, learned from all had lived under a system where basically government held sovereignty, a single person maybe, uh, or the king in parliament, a group of people held final authority. And if they hold final authority, it doesn't matter if you have a written or an unwritten constitution, 
what they say is the final say. They tell you what the Constitution means. Again, that's basically what we have today. Most people believe that the Constitution means what the Constitution means until the Supreme Court changes its mind. Or they believe, well, they really believe that the Constitution means what the politicians and the judges tell us it means until the politicians and the judges change their mind. And the only thing you can do about it is to wait for new people to come in and change their minds. But this is absurd. Uh, when you have sovereignty, meaning final authority, not in the hands of government, it's not up to government to say what the rules of government tell the government it can and cannot do. And that's what James Otis Jr. is getting at here. You know, they can't do this type of thing. And an act against the Constitution is void. This was a radical change in the views of the people kicked off there in Boston, 1761. Years later, Thomas Paine described it this way. A constitution is a thing antecedent to a government, and a government is only the creature of a constitution. So it's government at the bottom, constitution above government, but people above constitution. And he put it this way, a constitution is not the act of a government but of a people constituting a government. We heard similar things like this during the ratification debates from people like James Wilson. Ultimately, if you're going to talk about sovereignty, the people of the several states holding sovereignty or final authority, then the government is at the bottom of that food chain. It's just up to the people to treat it that way as well. And that uh, is reiterated by George Mason in April 1775, talking about power flowing from the people. He said, all power was originally lodged in and consequently derived from the people. And of course, if an act of the people creates the Constitution and the Constitution creates the government and the government doesn't have final say and acts against the, the, against the Constitution are void, well, then what do you do about it? There has to be some line in the sand. There are limits around what government can do. Otherwise, it's exercising arbitrary power and then you lead to a declaration of independence, etc. So you can hopefully see with my babbling here, what this circle leads to. But Patrick Henry put it this way in his Virginia Resolves of 1765. He basically was saying, look, okay, there's this Stamp Act thing, and we don't like it, and we don't like it because you're not authorized to do this stuff. If we are going to have this type of taxation, the only people who can do this are our own representatives. The people of, the, of, of Virginia are the only people who can make this decision. Now, they hadn't done that, so, well, of course, they were opposed to this type of thing. And he said resolved, and the Virginia resolves, these were very famous, they helped spark independence, according to some people, which I'll get to in a moment, resolved that His Majesty's liege people, the inhabitants of this colony, are not bound to yield obedience to any law or ordinance whatever designed to impose any taxation whatsoever upon them other than the laws or ordinances of the General Assembly aforesaid. So he's kind of like, and this is because of this, I've often called Patrick Henry the original tenther. I mean, this is so many years before the Constitution, before independence, before the Tenth Amendment. But the principle is the same, that the far-off general government is authorized to do certain things, and the more local things that affect the lives and liberties of the people, those can only be done by the government closest to the people, if the people allow that government to do it. And then when the far-off government goes beyond it, you don't just wait for it to stop doing the things it wasn't supposed to do in the first place. You have to remind the people that they are not bound to yield obedience. I covered Patrick Henry's resolves or resolutions against the Stamp Act in a standalone episode Almost uh, three years ago now, it's one of my favorites, Patrick Henry versus the Stamp Act. I will link to that one in the show notes so you can check that out. Now, talking about Patrick Henry and kicking off the revolution, James Otis Jr. kicking off the revolution, this guy who you're looking at up on the screen who was uh, nominated or became the attorney general some years later, well, that's not the guy. It's this picture of Patrick Henry, but it's a link to William Wirt's uh, 1817, 1818 publication of the book Sketches of the Life and Character of Patrick Henry. And he basically took the position that Patrick Henry's resolutions he published in this book is really what sparked independence. This was the beginning of the American Revolution in Virginia. 
And now some people, on the other hand, in, uh, had credited, and I mentioned this on Monday's show, some people had also credited John Hancock and his physical resistance, because if we're saying they're, you're not bound to yield obedience to taxes that they impose on you that they're not authorized to do in the first place, the Townsend Acts did that in 1767 as well. So John Hancock put that into practice with physical resistance to customs agents British customs officials in 1768, and some people actually look to John Hancock as the kickoff of the at least the physical resistance of the American Revolution. But anyways, this view, this book by William Wirt, because he was the attorney general there, and he was nominated, I'm not sure what year, it was 1817, 1818, but he was very well known. And if he's publishing this book, Sketches of the Life and Character of Patrick Henry, that basically credits Patrick Henry with starting the revolution. Well, I mean, this is just going to be just a quick side note. Here's a letter from John Adams to William Wirt in Gen- January of 1818. It starts out with, your sketches of the life of Mr. Henry have given me a rich entertainment. <laughs> This is pure John Adams. For those of you, I mean, I'm chuckling to this, but uh, this is a cocky dude. You know, they called him, I think, the hothead or whatever, things like that. But he certainly uh, had a way with words. Now, he and some other letters, he really, really liked Patrick Henry a lot. In fact, he gave him a lot of credit. He thought he was uh, more impactful than people like Richard Henry Lee and others. But it was just about the facts of the times and dates. And he said to William Wirt, the author, he said, if I could go back to the age of 35, Mr. Wirt, I would endeavor to become your rival, not in elegance of composition, but in a simple narration of facts supported by records, histories and testimonies. I would adopt in all modesty your title, but he would change the title and he would write a book that's called Sketches of the Life and Writings of James Otis of Boston, an imitation of your example I would introduce portraits of a long catalog of illustrious men who were agents in the revolution in favor of it or against it. Anyways, it's just interesting. And he sums that letter up. This is how he closes. After all this freedom, I assure you, sir, it is no flattery when I congratulate the nation on the acquisition of an attorney general of such talents and industry as your sketches demonstrate. I wonder how Wirt responded to that one. I don't actually think I've ever read one, but I actually learned a little bit more about this as I was researching this, and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, So I have often mentioned that John Adams referred to the beginning of the American Revolution. Of course, people in Massachusetts did and were taught that as they were growing up. The beginning of the revolution was 1761 or 1760, and then James Otis sparking the resistance. And then Jefferson and others looked at the Stamp Act and Patrick Henry's resolves against the Stamp Act as the beginning. And so there's some differences in where it started. But I don't actually think that's correct, how I've been saying it. Uh, Although there's a quote, a attributed to Jefferson in William Wirt's book talking about Patrick Henry. Jefferson actually clarifies that, and I was wrong, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So here's Benjamin Waterhouse, who had been writing back and forth to Adams about this. He writes to Jefferson in February of 1818, and he points out that Wirt's book in page 47. He makes Mr. Jefferson, he quotes Jefferson saying that, Mr. Henry certainly gave the first impulse to the ball of the revolution. And he said, if this idea be correct, we in New England have been brought up in error. In another place, Mr. Wirt Wirt fixes the precise time of the commencement of our controversy with England to the spring of 1764 to the attempt to force upon us the Stamp Act. Now, I have been taught all along to believe that the controversy and resistance to the design of Britain commenced in the beginning of the year of 1761, full three years before the Stamp Act was ever mentioned among us. So he's writing to Jefferson. He's like, hey, dude, you were quoted in this book as saying Henry kicked it off. You should know better than this. And Adams actually was a little cocky in that letter to Waterhouse, and Waterhouse shared it. Basically, he's like, hey, Jefferson was, what, just a teenager at this time. Like he, I don't think he really understood what was going on. But Jefferson actually was on board, and he wrote back to Waterhouse just a couple of weeks later. He said, you know, I, I received your letter where you observed that Mr. Wirt, on page 47 of his life of Patrick Henry, quotes me that Henry gave the first impulse to the ball of revolution. He said, I well recollect to have used such some such expression in a letter to him, and am tolerably certain that our own state being the subject under contemplation, I must have used it with that respect only. So he's basically saying, 
okay, here in Virginia, and of course, if you think about this, this makes a lot of sense. People didn't think of themselves as, you know, part of an American singular nation, of course. Jefferson, when talking about the beginning of the revolution, was talking about his own experience there in Virginia. Adams was talking about his experience in Massachusetts, and people were much more attached to their state and less concerned with what was going on in all the other uh, colonies, I guess, at that point, in other areas, because they were working to become, over the years, independent sovereign nations. Jefferson goes a little further near the end. He said, those you mentioned in Massachusetts as preceding the Stamp Act might be the first visible symptoms of that design. The proposition of that act in 1764 was the first here. Your opposition, therefore, preceded ours, as occasion was sooner given there than here. And the truth, I suppose, is that the opposition in every colony began whenever the encroachment was presented to it. And in some ways, I think he was also very correct because Dickinson was lamenting this to some degree in his letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania in 1767, talking about the New York Restraining Act. He was calling on all the other colonies to at least rally to the cause and pass non-binding resolutions opposing that because you can't turn a blind eye to what they're doing to the people in New York, because if you do, they're going to come after you as well. So we used a little self motivation. Anyways, what's more important than that debate that I just wanted to share with you just for a couple of minutes there are, of course, finding the harmonizing sentiments of the day from 1760, 1761 through 1775, 76. And some of them that I want to cover here just briefly, for example, the Suffolk Resolves of 1774, something that most people never hear of. We don't get taught this in government-run schools because government doesn't want to teach us how people resist government, of course. Well, these were passed in 1774. They called for non-compliance to the Coercive Act, so what we know today is the Intolerable Acts, disobedience to courts, tax resistance, and more. They were probably written uh, heavily by Dr. Joseph Warren. They specifically used the same type of phrase that Patrick Henry said, no obedience is due. So they aren't authorized to pass these acts. So the people here in Suffolk County, Boston, etc., no obedience is due. And that's the same type of message we had some years earlier from John Dickinson calling for the people to refuse to comply with the Stamp Act. He said, if you comply with the act, you rivet perpetual chains upon your unhappy country. Compliance, he said, establishes the detestable precedent. It is, therefore, he said, the Stamp Act is really just a test of your resolve. As long as you do one thing, no matter how small the act is, if you're complying with it, you're encouraging them to build upon that. Because once they have that detestable precedent, they're going to expand and expand and expand. They never stop doing stuff that they don't have to spend a lot of resources and time and uh, political, I guess, capital to deal with. So if so many people resist something, that's the only way you get rid of stuff, not just by begging. And James Otis Jr., here in, I think, 1762, he said, so long as people will submit to arbitrary measures, so long will they find masters. Again, there's that term arbitrary. Power exercise that is not authorized is an arbitrary power and it needs to be resisted because otherwise you will continue to have masters. So resistance, a line in the sand. And then here, John Hancock, as I mentioned on Monday's show, in his Massacre Day Oration of 1774, uh, he reminded us that resistance was to far more than taxation without representation. It wasn't just about taxation. It was opposition to the Declaratory Act of 1766, which claimed power over the colonies in all cases whatsoever. Unlimited centralized power. That is the same thing we have today under not the original legal meaning of the Supremacy Clause, but the distorted view that the government has thrust upon us that so many people actually believe or beg for, but don't resist. And that is that the federal government is supreme in everything that it does. The federal government is always supreme. All federal acts are always supreme, not just those that are pursuant to the Constitution or the delegated powers, but all the time until the federal government itself tells us that its acts weren't supreme, that it made a mistake and it has to stop doing those things. Anyways, here's John Hancock. He said, they have declared that they have ever had, and of right ought ever to have, full power to make laws of sufficient validity to bind the colonies in all cases 
whatsoever. All cases whatsoever was the exact phrase from the Declaratory Act, and they kept repeating this over and over and over through the documents, through the resolutions, the essays of the time from uh, 1766, at least there, through 1775, 76, etc. And he says, Hancock says, they have exercised this pretended right by imposing a tax upon us without our consent. So their opposition was not just about taxation without representation. That was just an example of the ways it was exercising unlimited power in all cases whatsoever. Later that year, October 14th, 1774, we have the, this is not just Boston taking this view. This is not just Hancock. This is not just the Suffolk Resolves. This is a unanimous passage of a resolution by the First Continental Congress. The Declaration Resolves And hear how they start it right at the beginning. They start with talking about the Declaratory Act and unlimited centralized power. Whereas since the close of the last war, can't forget that, the British Parliament claiming a power of right to bind the people of America by statutes in all cases whatsoever hath in some acts expressly imposed taxes upon them. So under their unlimited supremacy, they have sometimes done taxation, like the Stamp Act, like the Townsend Acts. <clears throat> then throughout the document, they list a bunch of other stuff. You can scroll through it, uh, and they talk about various acts of how they exercise this unlimited power. But they sum it up with this important message. Again, similar to what James Otis Jr. was saying, John Dickinson, Patrick Henry, and so many others. They say, to these grievous acts and measures, Americans cannot submit. So again, if they're doing stuff, if government is doing a bunch of stuff they're not supposed to do, and Americans just submit, this is not people living in the land of the free. That's a population on its knees begging for permission. Now, the following summer, after the hostilities broke out, so this is a couple of months after Lexington and Concord, this is July 6, 1775, we have the Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms. This is the, the Continental Congress passing unanimously their reason why there's fighting happening. And it was authored by Thomas Jefferson and John Dickinson combined. Now, Dickinson wanted to hold back on a Declaration of Independence the following year. He didn't think they were ready. Uh, Jefferson, of course, well, we know his role there. But here's how they put it together. Our attachment to no nation upon earth should supplant our attachment to liberty. So if we want a foundational principle of the American Revolution, it really is an attachment to liberty. That was the primary goal here. And they summed it up like this. In in our own native land, in defense of the freedom that is our birthright and which we ever enjoyed to the late violation of it, for the protection of our property acquired solely by the honest industry of our forefathers and ourselves, Against a violence actually offered, we have taken up arms. We shall lay them down when hostilities shall cease on the part of the aggressors, and all danger of their being renewed shall be removed. See, I'm trying to read this too fast because it's a long passage and not before. So there's a bunch there. There's property rights and things like that. But I'm focusing on freedom that is our birthright. You have freedom not because of a document, but because uh, you exist as a human. And this is about natural rights. And before I get to a little bit more on natural rights, I want to point out that this is the type of essential historical foundational information. We also work to put this these types of principles into practice today strategically. We work very hard every single day to get this information out to more and more people. And nothing helps us get that job done more than the financial faith and support of our members. Uh, You can join us for as little as two bucks a month. We try to make it as cheap and easy peasy as possible, but we will take that dirty government fiat. And I don't think anyone does more to stand for the Constitution and liberty more than the TAC, whether the government wants us to or not. And that's really the important part. And so we have some annual and lifetime five-year options as well, but two bucks a month is all it takes. And while I'm doing this, quick side note advertisement, I do want to say a huge thank you To just a handful of people who have joined us as members recently, I really, really cannot thank you enough for putting your financial faith behind our work. There's Brent in Missouri, John in Florida, Olivia in Minnesota, James in Arkansas, Michael in California. Awesome. And wasn't me this time. Ava in Tennessee and Bob in Florida. Thank you guys so, so much. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. But anyways, we're talking about 
natural rights. And that's how Samuel Adams summed it up at the beginning of his paper, The Rights of the Colonists, in 1772. And he said, among the natural rights of the colonists are these. So natural rights. You don't get these as a gift from government. You don't have to get a permit. You don't need a constitution. You have them because you exist as a human being. Among the natural rights of the colonists are these. First, a right to life. Secondly, to liberty. Thirdly, to property, together with the right to support and defend them in the best manner they can. And if we look at that last part, the right to support and defend them, there's no question as to why, when that gun control scheme was trying to be done uh, at Lexington Concord, why people were willing to take a stand in defense of that. So that's Samuel Adams focusing on natural rights and liberty. Here's Joseph Warren in a letter to Samuel Adams in 1774. He said, vigilance, activity, and patience are necessary at this time, but the mistress we court is liberty, and it is better to die than not to obtain her. (laughs) That is really prophetic stuff from Joseph Warren. John Dickinson, some years earlier, he signed off an important paper with as as a foundation and security of all the rest. So the basis is liberty. He said, I wish you a true love of liberty. Again, liberty being that big focus. John Adams back in 1765, September. Liberty must at all hazards be supported. And Thomas Paine, as things were getting a little difficult in the winter of 1776, these are the times that try men's souls. That's his American Crisis paper, December 23rd. He said, though the flame of liberty may sometimes cease to shine, the coal can never expire. And it's like I'm barely scratching the surface on the amount of times that we see in papers and and essays and speeches a focus on liberty, our attachment to no nation on earth, should supplant our attachment to liberty. That was the view of the Continental Congress when discussing why they were fighting back against the British. That was Jefferson and Dickinson and so many others. And here's Patrick Henry some years later in the Virginia Ratifying Convention lamenting that liberty was not the primary object anymore. And he said, when the American spirit was in its youth, the language of America was different. Liberty, sir, was then the primary object object. And so with with what I've covered here, and again, I'm just scratching the surface, and hopefully you will check out some of these other episodes and papers. I've got a bonus one here in a moment, but I think there are four main ingredients for a real American revolution. A revolution in scare quotes, not a war, but a revolution, a huge societal change that we need in order to live in a real land of the free rather than under the largest government, the largest empire in history. That is liberty based in natural rights, natural rights being the foundation of the supremacy of the Constitution and the supremacy of the people to the Constitution to anything and everything. So sovereignty, final authority being with the people. And of course, we just published a, a, a new ebook that we make available for our members called Tenth Amendment Power from the People that talks about this final authority. And of course, the opposition, number three, is opposition to unlimited centralized power, the Declaratory Acts. So we've got liberty based on natural rights, supremacy and sovereignty, opposition to unlimited centralized power, the Declaratory Act, and a line in the sand. When they go beyond the limits of their authorized power, what do you do about it? Do you beg them to stop doing it? You certainly can take that approach, but when they don't listen, what are you supposed to do? Continue waiting until generations come and go before government graciously does the right thing? That is not a free people. Thomas Jefferson told us that a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as a gift of their chief magistrate. And I do have one bonus one that I think is important that I don't think many people pay attention to because we can find plenty of people, not nearly enough, and I think that's the point here. We find plenty of people, you and I understand these things, we support these things. Does that mean we're in the midst of a revolution? Well, maybe the very early stages of a radical change of the viewpoints of the people. I know I've undergone that. I've you know, shifted to what I'm talking about today, and I probably have much more to learn still. But someone who used to proudly proclaim that they were a Marxist or a Trotskyite, really, really bad stuff because I was raised in government-run schools and taught that government was the solution to every problem without recognizing that, well, most of the problems came from government in the first place. But anyways, here's John Adams in a letter talking about the real American Revolution to Hezekiah Niles in February of 1818. He points out that 
This was a very, very unique revolution that happened, one unlike any in history. He says the colonies had grown up under constitutions of government so different. There was so great a variety of religions. They were composed of so many different nations. Their customs, manners, and habits had so little resemblance, and their intercourse had been so rare. So they were separate nations, really, separate people, separate heritage, religious, political, social viewpoints, so different. Massachusetts and Virginia were incredibly different at that point. Their knowledge of each other was so imperfect that to unite them in the same principles, in theory, and the same system of action was certainly a very difficult enterprise. So the same principles, sovereignty, final authority, natural rights, liberty, opposition to unlimited centralized power, a line in the sand, a call for disobedience and resistance to arbitrary power. He said the complete accomplishment of this in so short a time and by such simple means was perhaps a singular example in the history of mankind. Thirteen clocks were made to strike together, a perfection of mechanism which no artist had ever before affected. And I think Samuel Adams summed it up best in his uh, essay, Writing as Candidus in the Boston Gazette. I think this is October of 1771. He said, the truth is, all might be free if they valued freedom, and defended it as they ought. And I think that is the same thing for today or for any time in history. As long as people love and value freedom and know how to defend it and actually have the courage to defend it, Thomas Paine in his fourth American crisis said, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. So all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. Uh, I hope it was maybe a little inspirational, encouraging, something like that. We face a very, very difficult path ahead. But if we want to be on that path to liberty, which is, of course, the title of the podcast, we have to follow these essential core principles at very least. Uh, if you support the show, again, 10th Amendment Center com slash members. You can also smash the like button, leave reviews on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform. Uh, subscribe, get notifications, all this stuff that will help spread the word is so much appreciated, whether you're able to pitch in financially or do those other things or both. Thank you so much. Again, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you learned something. I hope you're having a great day. And I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.